Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. How indescribable is the love of God. Amen. It is beyond comparison. Even out of ten thousands and ten thousands to even speak a small part of the love of God, it is impossible to do while we're alive in this world. Amen. Uh, what a deep and beautiful uh, song. Um, I'm going to, uh, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump quick uh, straight into the Word of God. We're going to continue uh, our study of the book of James. Uh, we're nearing the end. We're in chapter 5. Uh, I will read verse um, 7 through thir- 12. James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be also, be also patient, establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brother, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay, lest you fall into condemnation. Amen. So, last time, uh, uh, last week, Justin spoke about the first, from the first six verses, and he talked about trusting in riches, and how in these days, you you know, it is very hard to, you know, in this, in this country we've come to, we have, you know, a lot more than we can ask or imagine, right? And finding our heart to be able to trust in God in the midst of that is very important, right? Not in our 401k or anything that we've built up, but rather trusting in God in the midst of whatever uh, abundance or lack that we have. Um, So then James uh, seems to just switch quickly uh, to a different topic, um, as he does often tend to do, uh, but here he seems to quickly s- switch, and he says, "Be patient, therefore, unto the coming of the Lord." So he's encouraging uh, patience, or just striving on this endurance until we uh, come to the time we've been all been waiting for, until the Lord comes back. Uh, so I'm going to skip to uh, so. There's uh, three things I want to talk about from this passage we uh, read today. One is the example he cited uh, in verse 11, which is, if you can go, yep, there you go. Uh, The first is the patience of Job, and what does that mean, and how does that apply? The second is the patience for God's redeeming plan. And lastly, patience for the former and the latter rain. So I'm going to jump to the first part of that, which is the patience of Job. Just to quickly reiterate the story of Job, all of us are familiar with it, but as you might be guilty of the same thing I am, uh, when we start to read the book of Job, we read the first two, maybe three chapters, and we just fast forward to the last three, right? Because there's a lot of talking going on and debating in between. Uh, There's a lot of deep things that are being discussed And at the end of it, God is forgiving of Job and angry with his friends, right? So what happened to Job? God testified in the beginning, uh, Job, uh, he's asking the devil. Uh, Satan is saying, I roamed around the earth, you know, and, uh, you know, trying to see what destruction and mayhem he could bring, I suppose. And he's asking Job, have you considered my servant Job? He's a perfect man. He hates evil. And what did the devil tell him? 
I can't touch him because you put a hedge around him. Amen? So as a child of God, if you remain in the hedge of God's protection, amen, we don't have to be afraid of anything that could happen to us, right? We're in the hand of God. God himself said what? He has gra engraven me in the palm of his hand. Yes? So, so God removed this hedge, if you will, and to allow uh, Satan to tempt Job, right? To test him. And when I say test or tempt, these are not light words because he went through some horrible uh, uh, testing or loss in his life. Everything that he thought he gained or he earned in this world, right? His servants, his cattle, his children, they were all lost over a matter of hours and days, very quickly, right? And he was now brought to a position where, you know, he thought he could rely or trust in the strength of all these things that uh, he had uh, to a state of uh, lack or nothingness, right? You all with me? All right. So now then finally, still Job stuck on with God. He did not curse God or turn back from believing in him. For he trusted in God's riches and goodness. And then finally the devil said, well, if I touch his health, then he's going to curse you, right? And finally God took that final hedge away from him and Job was inflicted with uh, boils or sores all over his body and he was now take the now the last thing that he could trust in was also taken away from him. He was in a miserable condition and finally his wife also seemingly gave up and did not want to associate herself with such a person and said, why don't you uh, curse God and die? Right? And it says in Job chapter 1, verse 24, in all this, God, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. In all this, God did not, uh, Job did not sin, uh, verse 22, sorry, did not charge God with wrong. So, and then, you know, he, we, as we know, his friends came, three of his friends. They sat in, well, it turns out there were four. Uh, the fourth one didn't say anything, uh, anything for a long time. Um, I'm actually not sure if he showed up later or not, but either way, they sat in silence for seven days, and then they, one after the other, engaged in a debate with Job of what is the cause of why all these things happened to him, right? Um, you all with me so far? Yes, okay, so each of them took turns, so um, the three of them made an argument and Job would respond, and then this, they went a second round, uh, and only the second time, only two of them, Zophar didn't say anything the second time uh, before Elu, Elihu, the fourth friend, spoke up. So the crux of the matter in their debate or discussion with Job is that there must be some sin that you had in your life that caused all the severe calamity to come upon you. Okay, that was the crux of the matter. And you should go read it for yourself and feel free to correct me. Um, uh, but this is the crux of the matter that you surely did something to deserve this. And that's why God brought this upon you. God does not do bad things to good people. Right? Have, have you heard that argument a lot? And yet, Job maintained his innocency, and Job maintained his trust in God, and did not, you know, uh, they pushed him to the, the limits of, I mean, this is a man who, think about this condition he's in, right? He's lost everything. Now he's sick, he's, you know, that is the last thing that we tolerate, right? And now he's lost all things that he can trust and rely upon and could bring him hope and joy. And he is still able to, what? As James said, patient endurance. Patient endurance. He held on to 
his belief and trust in God and maintained his innocency that God is still good, that I didn't do anything that brought this upon me, but God is sovereign. Amen? How do we know this? Because God himself testified of Job. God is not a liar. He said at the beginning, God, Job is perfect. He is sinless and he hates evil. Oh, how, what a blessedness to receive such a testimony from God of heavens. And he said, telling the devil, try and bring a charge against him. I will, with, will withstand you because you will not find it. Amen? And so his friends were not right in their accusations. Right? But this, so let's take a moment to examine how we respond to things that happen in our life. When circumstances change, when things that go don't go our way, do we still have this trust in God? When we lose the things that we thought we could hold on to, do we still hold on to the sovereignty of God? Amen? Like Job. That's why even later in the New Testament, James is able to point to Job as an example of patient endurance, right? Or when we see this in others, when somebody is going through a trial or a loss, I mean, this man has lost his children, right? And all of his children at the same time. It's an unimaginable grief. And are we, like his friends, trying to make sense of it in, the, in, the, in that in the, uh, in the uh, path of making sense of it, they're trying to find fault in Job. I mean, we have to be honest with ourselves. We do this ourselves. That when we see somebody go through a tough situation, we, what do we say? We say in our hearts, you know, we do some mental calculations. You know what, this person must do uh, this, this, and this. That's why this bad thing happened to them. I mean, we all do it. Okay, we can't excuse ourselves. We all do it because why do we do that? We do that because we don't want to believe or think that that very calamity could come upon ourselves, right? So in a sense, we believe in the Hindu principle of karma, right? In a sense, because what does karma teach us? That what you do, that has a repercussion, right? It does not trust in a sovereign God who does what he wills. But everything he does is good, right? So in uh, Luke 13, uh, uh, Jesus asked uh, his disciples, you know, this Pilate was killing the Galileans, and he asked his disciples, did the Galileans sin more than the others that this came upon them? What did he say? No, they didn't. This Tower of Siloam fell upon and killed, uh, I think, like 13 people. Uh, uh, and did they sin more than other people that has happened? No, God is sovereign. When we can't explain why something happened in those moments, we have to trust in God. Amen? And our role as fellow believers and brothers and sisters in Christ is not to bring accusations of right, self-righteous uh, you know, condemnation, but rather to be a pillar and a support and a comfort, right? Mend the broken heart. To strengthen the weak. To allow them uh, to continue in their patient endurance. So that just like Job was able to endure patiently. Amen. We can see that in our own church. We had four deaths so far. We've gone through immense grief and pain. Amen. Sometimes we question why, why does this happen to us? Think that we didn't think it could happen to us. Or you might go through a trial that nobody knows about. Right? That you don't, can make sense of. That you see other people that are happy, live successful lives. And why this one thorn is still sticking with you? Why is God not answering my prayer in this matter? I will encourage you that our God is a loving God. Amen? Amen? He is a patient God, and he is sovereign. 
He loves us more than you can imagine as we sang. That he loved us so much we can't compare that he sent his only son to die for us. Amen? Amen. We can't find a love like this and we can't make sense of everything that happens to us. Amen. But the answer can only found, be found in God. Amen. And God did answer Job in the end, right? Amen. He came to him in a whirlwind. First he rebuked him because Job's mindset was also changing. He was dark. What did God say? Who is darkening his um, counsel with words without knowledge? You're starting to say things that make no sense. You're questioning the sovereignty of God. And God spent two or three chapters explaining to him who he is. And he said, were you there when I created the heavens? Were you there when I brought all these things forward with the word of my power? I am a sovereign God. Amen. There is none like me. Yes, we can't make sense of every tragedy, every trial that comes our way. But in those moments, let us yearn to believe and turn to the sweet voice of God. Ask him to mend our hearts. And when we see others struggling and enduring with patience, let us go be like the three friends in those first seven days. Amen. Endure with them patiently. Because we can't predict what happens to us next the next moment or tomorrow or next year right the point of job and the story of job and his three friends is it's not that job sinned that came upon him and the the friends were more righteous it is that we are but a mere grass or a flower that fades as as we talked about earlier right in the face of a sovereign God, he didn't, we didn't deserve his love and mercy. But we surely will find his strength and compassion. He might not answer every prayer that we have. But he certainly does answer many of our prayers in a powerful way. We've seen, uh, as David sang, you know, remind me. He was in the midst of a g great distress and he said, remind me of your old judgment so that I may be strengthened again. When we are questioning God and when we are in that place where we are, can understand, ask God to remind you why you chose to believe him in the first place. Amen. Ask him to give you the answers or mend your heart to, to that situation. And endure with him patiently till, till, he hears, till you hear from him. Amen. Till he restores you. So that's the patience of Job. And God was pleased with him. And he, after he repented, God gave him more than he had before. Right? And he had uh, 10 more children. And he had more uh, wealth and possessions than he had before. And that is, you know, the, when, you, when you trust in God and when you wait on him, when, when you patiently endure and you receive an answer, right? That joy that you receive, it's like, you know, a childbirth, right? Our dear sisters endure for nine months in pain and travail, but the joy that we receive, that we birth through our sorrows and struggles, is, it's, helps us restore us once again, right? We don't remember the tough times, but we remember the joy that God filled our hearts with, right? And so, so let us remember that and come to that. Again, I don't say any of this to rebuke or condemn, but says we all go through situations. I've gone through situations. We don't know the answer or why certain prayers are not answered. Why certain things happened to us? Why did God choose to not come in a strong way in a certain situation? And why did God bring this grief upon us? We can't answer those questions many times. But God definitely mends our hearts. Amen? Amen. So the next part I was going to talk about is patience for God's redemptive plan. So the point of James, coming back to James chapter 5, the point of James, uh, the words here, 
he's really focused on one thing is remind us about the coming of Christ. Yes. Amen. Remind us that we have to patiently endure until the very end. Jesus said, he who endures till the end, the same will be saved. Amen. So James is reminding us. But what did he say before that? What did he talk about in the first few verses? What Justin talked about. That when riches increase, we've come to a rich place. We think that we have everything we need in this world. But James is saying, and then he does talk about those who were condemned and killed the just. But it's a reminder to everybody to say, stray patiently on the narrow path. Everything that we have, we receive from God. It can all be gone but in a moment. But stay true to the path of the gospel. Stay true to, to, to the way that you embarked upon. Stay true to the cross of Christ that you don't at some point lose your way, whether it's riches or trials or bitterness that have taken a hold of your hand, heart of whatever you, you lost in your life that caused you to take your eyes away from the cross. And he's saying stay patiently endure until the very end because Christ is coming soon. Amen. Amen. The cause is worth it. The joy that we receive is even more than what Job received in the end. It's an infinite times more uh, the blessings that we will receive if we patiently endure until the very end. Hallelujah. Amen. So as, as we're in this journey, are we like Job patiently enduring or are we like the three friends who are self-righteous, right? And harden their heart. We feel like, oh, we're coming to church all these years. We're following Christ. What's the use of it? You know, what's the point of coming to church? What's the point of being faithful? What's the point of all these things that you do? Who's, who's seeing this? And God, James is encouraging, stay patient and true to the way of the cross. Stay patient and true to the paths that you start upon. Amen? Amen. Because there is a latter blessing. A, a blessing that God showers upon just like he did upon Job at the end. Amen. So um, before I go to that slide, actually, if you can go back. Um, so I just wanted to bring a point here and then I'll go to my last point. Is that, see, God is eternal, right? He is not defined by time, matter, or space, right? So when Adam sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, he had already made a plan that his son would die to redeem Adam. You all with me? And Pastor John Berge has covered that really well. The seed of the woman will crush the head of this, the seed of the serpent. Amen? So this redemptive plan of God is being played out. You see this sight in Revelation chapter 5. You see and the, the, as we are in heaven... And they're looking for who can open the book, the seals of the book. And they see a lamb that was slain. This lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Amen. So it's like this piece of paper. It's a very crude illustration. See, if this is the beginning of time and this is the end of time in its eternity to eternity. Right? See, God is not defined by time. Time does not mean anything to him, right? But he deals with us in the constraints of time. Does that make sense? But we, so when, when Adam sinned, he already made a plan. It was not hashed out in the last second. You know, oh, let me, you know, he did not struggle with the solution for sin. And then finally after, you know, uh, Abraham and all these people they, he finally came up with a plan for man's sin and then Jesus at the last minute came down to die. No. Before Adam sinned, he made a plan that he loved man so much that he is going to die. He decided to die for him. Amen? So that's what I meant. That he died before the foundation of the world. That he saw this in, in eternity. Amen? But we are defined by time. We need patience, right? 
we don't receive an answer to the prayers at the moment we pray, right? We have to continue when we don't see things changing. We don't see that, you know, anything is happening different. Yesterday seems like today, right? All the things that I'm doing yesterday, I'm going to do this coming week. I'm going to get up, go to work, uh, you know, take care of my family, hang out with my friends, whatever it is that you do. We are subject to the constraints of time, matter, and space. But we, that is why God is saying especially, we have to patiently endure, even though it looks like, and Peter, uh, Peter says what? There will be scoffers the last time will say that the time of his coming is, you know, nothing's happening. You've been saying this for 2,000 years, that Jesus is going to come back. And the, all the word that James was written 2,000 years ago, right? He's saying Christ is going to come back quickly. But it's written in the context of eternity. Amen? It is going to be quick. It is on to us to patiently endure. That God will fulfill his redemptive plan. He will bring us to himself. Amen? Even Job, in the Old Testament saints spoke of it. Even Job said in, what did he say in, in the midst of his sorrow and grief? Verse, chapter 19, verse 25. For I know my Redeemer lives, and in the end he will stand on the earth. So even my flesh be consumed, with my eyes I will see God. Amen? Job had in his heart, that is, I don't care why, if I lost everything in this world. Everything that I had was a gift from God anyway. Even if my flesh is consumed away, I know my Redeemer will stand on the earth. Who told him this? How did he know that the, there is a Messiah and a Redeemer who's going to come back and take him back? He had that vision of God in his heart. He knew that if his earthly body was consumed away, that his redeemer will come back and restore him and bring him to himself. He was able to have the strength to patiently endure because of this glorious hope. Amen. So James is reminding us of the same hope that we have to patiently endure until the coming of Christ. Amen. This is the same rem uh, reminder that we need to have for ourselves. So I'm going to come back to my last point. Um, in verse 7, be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and has long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Uh, I'm going to read in Joel chapter 2, which is very familiar to us. Verse 20, um, 23, and then 28 on. Be, be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And then Zechariah also talks about in chapter 10 of the former and the latter rain. See, in Israel, uh, in the harvest cycle, when they planted, so the, uh, the former rain, they would have early at the planting season, they would have a moderate rain at the beginning of their planting season. It used to be in early winter. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then they plant, and before they harvest, there is this abundant latter rain that comes right before harvest that brings forth, that ushers in a plenteous harvest. Right? If that rain was lacking, the harvest suffers. Right? So that's what he's talking about is that the former and the latter rain need to happen to have a plenteous harvest. That's what James is talking about in the worship team. Please come up. Uh, well, the former and the latter rain are re uh, necessary for this plenteous harvest. And as we're in this world, as we're, you know, the world, you know, as we look at the course of events in this world, you know, sometimes we question what's happening around us. Lots of turmoil and trouble. And God is saying we need the former and the latter rain. You know, 
Uh, we, some, some of us experienced a former rain at some point in our life, but we've, now our harvest is being delayed. We're, we've gone dry and parched without the dew and the rain of the Holy Spirit, and he wants you to have the latter rain. Amen? So you might harvest just like Job experienced the latter rain after he endured, he received a blessing at a harvest uh, that he harvested at the end toward the latter part of his life. And God is saying that he wants to bring this uh, rain upon us. But what's different, <coughs> excuse me, what's different about what Joel is saying is that he's going to give the former rain and the latter rain. When? At the same time. At, uh, as this coming clo draws close, I believe that God is wanting to send a revival to revive those who have never experienced this former rain, but also give the latter rain to those who have kind of gone, gone away and need a refreshing. So let us in these days, as we've been praying for the Holy Spirit and the move of the Holy Spirit, we can't patiently endure and, and we will wilt away and fade away. We can't patiently endure without the strength and power of the Holy Spirit. We can't bring in the harvest without the latter rain. And so as we've come together, as, as we are enduring these days, let us ask God, the God of the harvest, to send workers, but we need the former rain and the latter rain. The God, the God of the Spirit, or the Spirit of God to come in abundance and move in our hearts and to revive us again and to bring us out of our self-righteousness and the bitterness that have taken us away from God. And that we may bring forth a plenteous harvest for God in these last days. May his name be glorified.